On today's Visual Studio Toolbox, we're going to look at the future of Visual Studio. We're going to look at personal productivity. We'll see things like refactoring and IntelliCode. And we're going to look at cloud productivity. We're going to see time travel debugging and how you can keep your secrets safe. Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today are Amanda Silver. Hi. And Kendra Havens. Hi. And then later on, Anthony Cangelosi. We, we're going to need a bigger desk. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the 250th episode of Visual Studio. Awesome. Ooh. Congratulations. Thanks. And so it makes a perfect time for you guys to be on. Yeah. Now, uh, people might know or might not know that at Build, you guys gave a talk, the present and not too distant future of Visual Studio. Um, and if you go to the build page and try to watch the video, like I did, I wasn't able to make it to the talk, but I really wanted to watch the video. And the video is not there because there were audio or video or some issues. Some kind of capturing yes. issues, yeah. And so I thought, hey, wait a minute. You guys did the talk and people want to watch. I got Toolbox and it's the 250th episode. This is like a match made in heaven. It's awesome. <laughs> It's, thanks for inviting us on. Thanks we for doing it. Really, to do this. It was, it was, it's always a lot of work to kind of get the build presentation ready mm -hmm. to go, and it was a little bit disappointing that it didn't get captured. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. But, but we're we very excited. We can do yeah. it again. We're excited <laughs> exactly. to do it again, and it's, and it's soon enough afterwards that it's all still working. Yeah. yeah it's great. So we're going to look at things in Visual, some things in Visual Studio today, some things that are coming. Yeah, I mean, so basically what I always try to do with the future of Visual Studio talk is to show not just what people can get on their box today, mm -hmm. but actually what they'll be able to get on their box very, very soon. So some of the things are things that actually launched that day at Build. Right, um, and that was 2017 15.7. Right, as, as well, well as 15.8 <laughs> Preview 1. Preview one right. As well as some extensions that are custom that don't ship in either. Okay. Um, but other stuff that we're going to show you are things that aren't shipping in any fashion yet, okay. but are we're, are in progress, and we just want to show the world what we're working on. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I mean, you know, part of this is we just have an incredibly passionate team that, that really takes developer productivity to heart. Yep. You know, myself, I've been working on it for about 17 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I know that every second that we can shave off of a compile it at debug loop really yes. makes a huge difference for developers. So that's yep. really what we focus on. Um, so, you know, at this point with Visual Studio, we have, it's like an entire category, an entire family of products with Visual Studio, with VS for Mac, with Visual Studio Code, mm -hmm. App Center, and te Team Services, and obviously the connection to Azure. So, um, what we were really focused on for this talk was really t just talking about Visual Studio on Windows. Mm -hmm. What have we been working on there? Okay. Um, but the momentum for Visual Studio has been pretty phenomenal. I mean, this is a quote, you know, one of the things that we saw from the Stack Overflow survey from 2018 is that VS Code just barely yeah. edged out Visual Studio as the most popular developer environment across the, across the board for all developers. Um, you can see that kind of together, yeah. you know, it's a pretty huge uh, a portion of the market. So a lot of people using Visual Studio or VS Code as their develop developer tools. Um, the other or thing, both. yeah, exactly. The other thing is that our kind of main languages in Visual Studio that a lot of people use, C Sharp and TypeScript, have also grown pretty mm -hmm. dramatically over the last couple of years. Um, but this is just from the Stack Overflow survey. You know, at this point, we have about 6.9 million uh, developers using Visual Studio Monthly. Wow. It's pretty amazing. And we have 3.6 million users monthly using VS Code, mm -hmm. which is just outstanding. For, for 2017, Visual Studio 2017, we now have 2,400 extensions that apply to that version. So the community around Visual Studio 2017 is, is, is present, it's there, yep. and everybody's excited about it and using yep. all these Last extensions. Last week's episode was uh, Justin Clarebert with his hot extensions. Perfect. He has a, he has a very uh, popular one, and he's also super passionate yeah. about everything that he does. Um, but the other thing that really makes the developer community really um, productive is the the community that has been built around it. And I just pulled one of those uh, facts here, mm -hmm. which is that for for .NET Core. There are 19,000, more than 19,000 contributors that contribute to .NET Core. 
Um, and this is just one of our many open source projects yep. that kind of support, you know, the the Microsoft uh, developer community overall. And that's not including Microsoft developers. That's 19,000 contributors outside of Microsoft. Right. So that's just huge. And things are, are more likely to be open source than not these days. Like, that's kind of the right? default, Live especially. Share, right? Live share is open source, isn't it? It's on well, GitHub so, or not? So, so we try to have it be as open as possible okay. in terms of like our roadmap. Um, the, the, um, VS Code itself is open source. Right. LiveShare is a service that actually runs in, yep. in the cloud. So that service is not open source. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so since Visual Studio has launched, you know, I, this is, I can't even go back <laughs> <laughs> in history long enough to kind of cover um, the entirety of right. Visual Studio just because there are so many things that have shipped since then, they wouldn't fit on one slide. So I just went back five releases just to cover um, a bunch of the main features that have shipped in and the last releases. this is just releases. since October. This is since October. Right. So, you know, we've just continued to bring out new, new value, new uh, functionality in mm -hmm. every subsequent version of, of VS. Um, and the other thing that we've really tried to do is to make it so that the it's easier than ever to adopt the previews. Mm -hmm. So a lot what we've tried to make possible is that you can install the released version of Visual Studio side by side with the preview version yep. without impacting your productivity of your day-to-day -day right. job. So if everything is working with the released version, fantastic, but if you want to test out a new um, feature that we're that we're talking about yep. today, then you can install the preview. The only constraint is disk space. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and and kind of see what's going on. The two right. will sit side by side on your machine, and they won't interact with each other. Um, and we've also really tried to make the update process really streamlined, so that it's just a click to basically update um, your latest version of the preview and yeah, kind of get the it's next actually version. It was always pretty easy, but now it's even easier because inside Visual Studio, Visual Studio will launch the installer for you and close itself down and then restart itself. That's right. So I thought exactly. it was pretty easy <laughs> when you had to just close and go to the installer. Now it's even easier. Yep, for sure. So definitely encourage everybody to install the preview yeah. alongside their the RTM to release. Okay. Um, so in terms of Visual Studio, what we think about is basically four different kind of um, areas. First is that we want any developer to be able to build any app for any platform. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that'll be another show that we'll talk about sure. that I can cover those demos. Um, but then the next is we want it to be faster than ever. It's the, we know that performance is one of the top requests that we have always have yep. for Visual Studio, so it's a constant goal for us. Um, we also know that productivity is incredibly important. And so there's lots of little things around hotkeys or refactoring features or things like that that make you uh, so productive. And then um, the last part is that it's connected to you, that we know what's important to you, that you can, you can build what you need to build, but also that you can give us feedback mm -hmm. back into the product so that we can fix bugs, so that we can address the issues and address your feature requests as, yep. as quickly as possible. So with that, what I wanted to do was to invite Kendra to do the first demo, which will be all about productivity. All right, cool. So, Take it away, Sweet. Kendra. I think we have a couple slides yeah. first um, yeah. because I really wanted to show this perf comparison video. Um, so on either side, if we can switch nice. that. Yeah. yeah. So this is different versions of Visual Studio side by side. And on the left, you have 15.0, and on the right is 15.7. Now, these are about a year apart. They're both loading the Roslyn solution, which is huge, 162 projects, over 4 million lines of code. And you can see on the right side, we're done. Wow. The solution loaded in 15 seconds. That's four and a half times faster than what it used to take. And those are just a year apart in releases. So we've made huge, huge effort there. Another big thing we changed, if I can call out the attention to keep your eye on the test explorer, 
um, we changed how test discovery takes place. So now, instead of needing a built assembly, it just discovers tests through your source code. So it doesn't require a build. As soon as you add tests or edit them, Ooh, they just appear. Nice. So it's all it's all essentially a Roslyn analyzer, but it's so much faster than um, the assembly-based discovery that we had before. Mm -hmm. And you can see in the video, it'll get up to 10,000 tests uh, really soon here. There it is in just a few seconds. And if we went back to the left side in 15.0, that'd still take another 90 seconds to load. So huge improvements there that Very I'm so cool. excited <laughs> uh, yeah, to talk Very about. Cool. <laughs> uh, so that was all .NET improvements. We also wanted to call out a lot of the C++ performance improvements as well. Um, all across uh, the C++ scenarios, so solution open, memory usage, debugging, renaming and refactoring, and incremental builds, all of those have are multiple x's times faster than they were before. Um, and all of these benchmarks were used with the uh, open source, the Chromium solution, which mm -hmm. is over 4,000 projects. Um, yeah, cool. that's what we found in our labs. Okay, and now I think we're ready to dive into my demo. So I'm also going to load the Smart Hotel 360 app. Um, so you are using, and let's, if we can try and be clear, this is preview. What features ah, are in 7, 15.7, <laughs> <laughs> what are in 15.8? This is 15.8. I have a summary slide that we can okay. view after the demo okay. that actually will right, summarize cool. which ones are in 15.8 and which ones are in 15.7 okay. and what's still okay, coming. Cool. Um, yeah, because we packed in a lot of stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of experimental mis extensions on my machine. It makes the demos more interesting. <laughs> yep. um, so I'm going to go ahead and open the Smart Hotel 360 solution. Um, and it's just five projects, but again, it's going to load really quickly. And keep your eye on the test explorer. So I actually loaded in a very large test project solution with over 5,000 unit tests. Um, so that's what it's actually discovering right now. Done. Mm -hmm. 5,000 nice. and two nice. tests. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know I kind of made that point twice, but like I can't <laughs> help it. it I'm the unit testing PM. <laughs> I got to call this stuff out. So I'm going to go ahead and run these tests. Uh, and you can see some changes that we made to make a more responsive test explorer during test runs. So all the tests that are pending to execute have this clock icon. And tests that are currently executing get this progress ring mm. as it goes. So cool. if you have a very long test run and you want to know what test is actually holding it up, you mm -hmm. can just look in the test explorer and it'll be called out right there in front of you. Um, so another thing that I used but didn't call out was um, we added this hierarchy view in uh, Visual Studio 2017. I think it first came into 15.6 uh, okay. update, but um, you can get it in any update after that. So it organizes tests by project namespace and then class. That was a really highly requested feature. So I'm going to go ahead and investigate this failing test here. And uh, looks like, oh yeah, it's this one. And it looks like I'm going to have a problem with this guest request function. So I'll go ahead and navigate there. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and turn on live unit testing as I investigate why this is failing. So I can right click in the Solution Explorer to only include this project of tests. Because remember, I have that giant 5,000 test project solution. Mm -hmm. You could imagine that those are like integration tests and not unit tests are not relevant to what I'm changing. So I could only include a subset of tests in live unit testing um, to actually investigate what the problem is. So I'm, now I see the live unit testing glyphs in the editor, and I can actually go to the line where I see something interesting happening. So I know all of the tests, out of the tests covering this line, at least one is failing, but I know this line is good. So I'm thinking my problem is over here. So if I open the glyph of live unit testing and I hover over the test that's failing, I can also see the error message. And it says I'm getting a null reference exception. So I'll actually go ahead and debug that test um, from the live unit testing glyph. And that means, again, just super helpful. I don't actually need the test explorer open to mm -hmm. debug the test that's covering my production code, um, which is very helpful. So the exception helper popped up. I'm getting a null reference exception. This is super helpful because it's actually telling me what variable I'm getting it on. 
So I'll go ahead and add a null check to this. One of the many uh, refactorings that we added uh, in uh, update 15.7 is null check. I was just about to suggest that would make an interesting <laughs> extension. Really? To add null checks. Yes. Uh, that well, was my I would first agree thought. with you. <laughs> into the product. That's even better. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, man. So I'll go ahead and add that. And that's actually, that's in the product. That's not like a special one that is in no the doubt. extension or preview. Oh, yeah. Like cool. that's baked in for and sure. You get 15.7. Right, fine. fine, so you've already It'll handled be in my there. feature request. How about <laughs> making it a default property that anytime I create a method with arguments, it automatically adds null checks for me? That would also be cool. <laughs> I'm wondering what Casey is planning for that. I'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay. Um, wouldn't be surprised if she was uh, actually looking into it. So you can see as I'm making changes cool. to this method, mm -hmm. live unit test, testing, rerunning tests in the background as I type. OK, cool. So, um, so now you can see all of my tests are passing. So I'll scroll down a little bit and uh, show you uh, one of the newest, coolest refactorings that we added. Sorry, coolest is a strong term, but I'm a huge <laughs> geek. So anyway, um, so this is my method for, um, this is my calculate chocolate method. Um, this is as if, it, like let's say the guest is leaving comments in our hotel okay. app. So I can use Azure Cognitive Services to analyze the sentiment of the comments that they leave mm -hmm. and figure out like if they're negative or below a certain score, I can text housekeeping, hey, we should leave extra chocolates on their pillow to kind of well, sweeten the deal. Like there's too many chocolates being left. <laughs> we should probably <laughs> add a check for that. <laughs> yeah. No, no one would complain that. What are you saying? <laughs> I know. Um, so, Notice I'm using a for each loop to iterate through um, my sentiment batch. I can, and uh, the refactoring we added was for each to for loop. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Um, so as soon as I add that, it asks if I want to rename the variable that I'm iterating through. Um, and I can apply it. And I can also go back from for loop back to for each. Nice. Just one of those lovely little things so that people want. <laughs> are the so we've now, in a handful of minutes, seen a couple things that are in the product that are cool to know. Um, they may have appeared recently. They may have appeared three years ago. Who knows? Um, is there a, uh, are, do we do a good job of docking these types of things? I mean, are the refactorings all listed somewhere so that I, I could easily go see what's in there? I would point you first to, we do have a documentation page on its, uh, I think, .NET tips and tricks, or okay. tips and tricks for .NET developers on docs.microsoft.com. Okay. Uh, we always update that with like the latest sort of tips and tricks that people really want to know. Mm -hmm. And there, we're really good at calling out exactly what update things are in. Okay. The other thing is we also publish our release notes. Yes. So for every there version of Visual Studio that has an update, mm -hmm. we will have a release notes that is associated with that update. So you right. can actually go back okay. and look. And they're generally categorized. If you want to go look back and look at all of the refactoring things, okay. you can look at what's there for refactoring. Yeah. Um, or for a particular language, you can look at that as well. Right. Yeah. Like the, the screwdriver, which I noticed last week uh, when we Justin was on uh, doing extensions. That was the first time I'd ever seen the screwdriver. Mm, instead is that, of the light bulb, yeah. Yeah, yeah. is that so new? Is that in the preview? Is that in 7? When did that it's appear? It's been in a while. It's been in there Since, a while. Yeah. Okay. I think it was uh, at least earlier this year. OK. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess I need yeah, to do it, more code. Um, I, I think it, it it's to call out when a code fix is there, when uh -huh. IntelliSense with the light bulb, when it's a light bulb, it's like, um, maybe it needs to be a refactoring or some other warning, mm -hmm. and but when it's a screwdriver, it's actually a code fix. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so think tool fix right. light bulb yeah. suggestion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Uh, so I know I have a test that's actually covering this method. So let's go take a look at it, and I can navigate to that test. I know it's called chocolate sentiment test, and I can use camel casing in my uh, search. So that's Control T to open mm -hmm. the the search box um, or navigate to box, and then I can yeah use camel casing. I can also um, ooh uh, search by line, files, member types, all of that. Cool, all cool. that jazz. 
So that'll take me right to the chocolate sentiment test. And here is the are the guest messages that I'm inputting to make mm -hmm. sure my Azure Cognitive Service is finding the right stuff. Um, a lot of these actually seem really positive. Let's go ahead and add some more negative ones to see if uh, it'll still catch the negative sentiment. So I can hit Control D to duplicate that line. Oops, that I had selected, as long as I don't then delete it when I'm trying to add a comma. There we go. <laughs> um, and one new feature that people are incredibly excited about. This isn't, I don't think this is even in the 15.8 preview it yet. Is. Multi-cursor? It is. Is multi-cursor yeah. in the 15.8 <laughs> preview. <laughs> um, so I can hold Alt and select multiple lines. And now Ooh. I can type in them. So very right. Oh, nice. <laughs> so nice. Bad. Needs more chocolate. Okay. <laughs> cool. So oh, I just cool. added. Let's see. Four sort of more negative sentiment lines. So I'll go ahead and bump that up to eight, and I'll go ahead and rerun that test to see if my Azure Cognitive Service catches it. And I get my little pending clock icon. And yeah, it, it worked out. OK. Very nice. So I actually wasn't super familiar with Azure Cognitive Services when I started using it. Um, I can go back to my calculate chocolate method. And when I call the cognitive service, I actually see, OK, I needed to create a language batch to figure out what the sentiment is in all of the multiple languages that I inputted it. And then I needed to. Um, find the sentiment on each of those. And it was actually, it's only about 30 lines of code, yeah. but since it was just an API I wasn't familiar with, a super helpful feature um, for f exploring uh, a new NuGet reference that I was using was using control click to navigate to the decompiled sources of my reference. So this is, mm. this is the feature. It's navigate to decompiled source. Yeah. Um, so we uh, actually partnered with Isle Spy, I think, to help us kind of figure out what um, uh, this would look like. And uh, I know this is Azure Cognitive Services, so I know it's fine for me to decompile it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that warning message that you first see is um, kind of warning the user that, hey, you should check the EULA. It's a bit uh, of legal uh, <laughs> It's yeah. a bit of legal ease, yeah. You know, looking for at, you're decompiling some right. source. Yeah. But this okay. is Microsoft source, so we're OK. Sure. So we're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I checked with the Azure Cognitive Services guys. And they're they were okay like, with that. Okay, okay, yeah. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, it needed multiple different strings, and it was just really helpful to know what order they needed them in. Um, so. It's great to navigate to decompiled sources, but what if I could actually navigate to a source that's open source on my machine yeah. and try to figure that out? That's the next thing I want to show you. <laughs> um, I'll go to, so this is my, let's say a, a hotel guest wants to request a shuttle to the airport. I'm using Casey Uhlenhut's bus helper class that she published to NuGet using the latest .NET Core preview. And the way you can, the way um, these NuGet package creators can publish them enables them to embed a source link. So when mm -hmm. I call this function, I can actually control dot and navigate to it. But this is still decompiled source. What if I wanted to actually debug through it? No way. So I can set a breakpoint. Um, and let's see how this works. So as I step into this function, it can actually step into the bus info helper class. Now, when I first ran this, it said, hey, you're using source link. Do you want to pull this source onto your machine? And now you can see when I hover over this bus helper.cs at the top mm -hmm. of my file, it shows that this is a NuGet reference in my app data local. This is, this is kind of like like web, web front end developers might be familiar with what the browser does, mm -hmm. where where basically, if I have a JavaScript file or a CSS file that's loaded at runtime for my client application, you'll see in a browser debugger mm -hmm. that you're going to have basically the, the, the files that were inferred at runtime. Um, so you'll actually see kind of the runtime version of those files. This is very similar to yeah. that, but for .NET, where basically we're using NuGet to actually figure out what's, what's executing and then loading that in Visual Studio. Very nice. 
and then I can step through it and yeah. see how my NuGet <laughs> reference is actually handling the data that I give it, which is just and, and super the package fun. developer has to enable that. Is that correct yeah. or not? Yeah, they have to specifically publish it with the latest.NET Core preview. And okay. I think there's some configuration that they will have to do in their um, CS Proj. But it's all documented. And we've had a lot of uh, interest as soon as we announced this uh, cool. with people figuring it out and asking if it can work with VSTS. It can <laughs> and Git and everything. So nice. it's really exciting. Um, the next super cool thing I want to show you um, is Back in my airport shuttle request, here I'm, well, how much have we heard about IntelliCode in the past week? Because when we announced it at Build, it was like, Pow. OK. So this is IntelliCode. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. This is IntelliCode. So for people that missed that, what yeah. is IntelliCode? IntelliCode is, uh, thanks for asking that question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I get too excited. IntelliCode <laughs> is a machine learning algorithm that we ran over 2,000 .NET repos up on GitHub that were open source with over 100 stars. And it learned what code patterns and practices are mm. expected in okay. certain contexts. And now it's able to reor reorder, for example, your dot completion. So normally, we would load an alphabet, alphabetized right. static list. Mm -hmm. Now we can say in certain scenarios, oh, people are going to use dot .length or dot .split, dot .trim. Those are the more popular functions used. So this is saying that over, we're noticing that when people are working with strings, these are the things that people are most likely yeah, to use. Yeah, so, so, so basically, IntelliCode, you know, what we were trying to do is to say, well, how could AI make a developer more productive, right. right? And so one of the applications is IntelliSense, where by looking at all of these open source code repositories, we mm -hmm. can see the code patterns that are in there. And the important thing is that it's not just what's popular, what's kind of most popularly used, most frequently used, mm -hmm. or most recently used. It's actually looking at not just the patterns of those open source repositories, but also the context of the code that you're writing. Oh, so let me so show pay you that right close now. attention, okay. super close That's attention to the completion that. list of what Rob, of what Kendra's going to show you. Yeah, so you can see at the top I've got length and replace. Mm -hmm. What if I changed this um, variable instead of var? I actually used a string array. It automatically Ooh. bubbles up split. Not only does it do that, but it also tells me what overload I most likely want to use, which is very helpful. And split has like 10 oh. overloads, which is super nice. Oops. That is cool. So it's basically Pretty taking sweet. the model of the open source repositories mm -hmm. that it grokked, yep. and then combining it with the context of the code that you're writing to figure out what's, this, what's the smartest completion list we could possibly right. provide to you. Cool. And yeah. the next thing, also cool things, I've changed these both back to var, but now it knows to also put split at the top here because I just used it in this context. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, also so how much is split. it looking at what lots of people do versus what you typically do? Is it taking that into account? It's taking both of those okay. things into account. So it's not yeah. just a most frequently used list. Okay. It's also taking the context of the code that you're writing. So right. if she used split pr previously, then you're going to have a different completion list than if she hadn't used it yet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. You, you can and show. And you can article. imagine that ultimately, eventually, Visual Studio would say, "Well, the code you're writing is going to work, but most people do it differently." Do you want to change, right? Yeah, I mean, could we, could, we, we could, yeah, right? we certainly could. So, yeah. so one of the things that we're looking at is. Um, other kinds of code analysis that could indicate, for example, that you're using an unconventional calling right. pattern for an API. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This yeah. actually leads really well into editor config, <laughs> 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 which is exactly what I was going to show off next. Um, because you were kind of talking about how to customize what suggestions we're getting. Mm -hmm. um, so, and Editor config is already a great way to, here I have it at, in the Solution Explorer at the top of my project, it's already a great way to document and enforce your code style across yep. your teams. Um, so when you combine editor config with IntelliCode, you can actually do some really interesting stuff. So we've now added, let's say I right click 
specifically on my test project, and mm -hmm. I'm using different code styles within my test project. Right. So I want to actually um, hone what suggestions people are seeing. Um, I can right click on specifically my test project and go to add new item. And now when I try to add an editor config, it, there's actually an IntelliCode suggested editor config that learns from this project that I'm working <laughs> in. I feel like I'm making your day. It feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go ahead and add that. And you can see I had a bunch of um, dots underneath my VARs. Mm -hmm. You can go back there. Um, and as soon as I rerun code analysis on that, it'll actually say, oh, this is an expected pattern now. Um, so I'm not getting the suggestions there. So I could go ahead and edit this local editor config. Now, this is still inheriting from the root one, right. except for where, yeah, it disagrees. Yeah. So I could promote these uh, warnings on using var instead of explicit type to errors. And as soon as code analysis reruns on this, I'm now going to get some red squigglies saying, hey, you got a lot of problems with this document. Oh, so this is like the new April Fool's gag is you go into somebody's machine Ooh. and mess the <laughs> config. Yeah. So when they launch Visual <laughs> Studio, all of a sudden they have 3,500 errors when yesterday everything was fine. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, this it's is really. It's hours of fun. This is <laughs> not, so not just for, for gags. Like, this is actually kind of important for productivity because um, if you think about it, uh, actually, we know that about 18% of the comments on a typical PR mm -hmm. are actually style related. Yeah. So if you can get a developer at the point at which they're typing the code mm -hmm. to write the right code so that they don't yeah. have to have somebody review it and then have a comment and then yeah. respond to that comment, that could save a huge amount of time for your team. Right. The other thing that we find is that for, for new developers joining a team, um, Often what happens for junior developers is they kind of wad up like a, a large, you know, PR pull request. Oh, yeah. um, and then they check it in. And then because they didn't get it reviewed kind of leading up to that, they end up with a huge long list of comments mm -hmm. that then makes them gun shy for the next subsequent PR. Right. So with this and having styles be inferred, and then explicitly um, kind of enforced, yep. you can actually get the developer to be much more productive. Right. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we find, and you know, people make jokes out of this, but it's just, it's it's funny because it's true. <laughs> I think all all jokes are kind of funny because they're a little bit true. Um, is that people fight over styles? Yes. And the th and you might have a particular sorry about that. Uh, might, you might have a particular perspective on whether or not you should use var versus explicit type. Right. What's cool about the editor config <laughs> inference? Tabs versus spaces. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. right? Exactly. <laughs> What's cool about this, though, is you don't actually need to have a debate over um, style without having data. Mm -hmm. This now actually looks at your code base and says, this is the dominant style in your code mm -hmm. base. So whether or not you, know, you, st you disagree with the dominant style, that's still may be an interesting conversation, right. but but you can actually take the dominant style and have it be inferred and then explicitly written out yeah. and, and then have it be that. you can use editor config to basically enforce it because you can decide, yeah. you know, var versus not var, right? On this particular bunch of code, we never use var and that's right. our rule. Mm -hmm. You can set it to an error in the editor.config and basically lay down the law, mm -hmm. right? Or we prefer var, so then maybe it's just a squiggly. You can use that in the editor yeah. config. Right. right. I didn't think about IntelliCode reading what the pattern is, actually solving these arguments for people. Well, we'll I mean, see. it might start the arguments oh, in no. some ways, what but we done? but <laughs> but I think I think in terms of making it making what your styles are explicit, yeah, uh, with explicit rules that you can then mm -hmm. debate, like that. Hopefully, we'll save time. Okay. But it is yeah. cool that you'd, you'd come into a big bunch of code, and you're, you're now new to this project, and you don't know, do we use var or not? Right. To have IntelliCode gently lead you down the path, yes, the vast majority of times in this project, people are using var. Maybe you should consider yeah. that. Right. Would be the, a nice, nicer way than the other <laughs> enforcing it. That we often find is that, like, your local style might be consistent, right? Because mm -hmm. you're working on one particular file or a, a, a couple of methods and you're consistent in that style. Right. 
but other files in the project have a different style. Right. And you might not ever see those because yes. you just don't interact with those files. This allows you to kind of get the, the complete project style mm -hmm. to be explicitly codified. Yeah. Cool, yeah. very cool. The last thing I want to do in this is code cleanup, control KD, so automatically applying all of the little uh, uh, style rules and code fixes in your editor config. So that shortcut is just control KD for code cleanup and whew, now I can breathe. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what that, that did, that, is that this new? is a brand That's new pretty thing. pretty new. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so now, nice. that, now that your style of rules are explicit and enforced by editor config, you now have little dot, dot, dot or squiggles yeah, or whatever throughout your place. code base. And okay. this can now fix it all up. Yeah. Nice. It also fixed where my curly braces are. Mm -hmm. So y yeah. you can see for this was particular file, watching. <laughs> I mean, this made this made changes throughout right. throughout the entire file, yeah. um, and you don't. She didn't actually have to visit all of those places with her cursor. Cool. Yeah. So Robert, you asked me earlier what's in. Uh, which version of Visual yep. Studio? This slide kind of summarizes it. Um, a lot of the newest code refactorings I showed, so for loop to for each, it's brand spanking new in 15.8. Okay. Um, IntelliCode uh, is in 15.8, um, but you do need to grab a preview that I think is private right now, and you need to sign up. I'll, I'll talk about it in the next slide. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and multi-cursor, that's very new as well. Code cleanup and debugger stepping is all in the okay. latest. Um, everything else, live unit testing, the test explorer, fast test discovery, uh, go to definition with control click, uh, navigate to decompiled assemblies, all of that is in the Visual Studio 2017. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right. And sh we talked a little bit earlier about some of the performance improvements mm -hmm. that we've made. Another one that we didn't show off but is worth mentioning because it's such a big deal is Git branch switching. That used to take so long in Visual Studio and now it's a lot, lot, lot faster. Mm -hmm. So hopefully people <sighs> will enjoy that as well. So um, but Kendra showed a little bit of IntelliCode. She showed yep. basically two features out of many of what we're working on. But the idea here is that we want to figure out how AI can help the individual developer and developer teams be yep. more productive. Sure. And so she showed how we can have a more productive IntelliSense experience and also have inferred styles um, so you can you can kind of have enforcement and consistency right. in your code base in her productivity demo. But one of the things I hope we can show you next time when we talk about team productivity is how it can help you find issues fast, faster mm -hmm. and actually identify bugs in your code base yeah. and also make your code reviews more productive. Well, I love I love the whole concept behind IntelliCode. Yeah, because you could do a whole bunch of surveys and find out what do you prefer, blah blah. Or you could just look to see what people are doing and then have Visual Studio in the background, you know, when it's appropriate, kind of nudging you in the right direction. Right, exactly. Awesome. Yeah. So if people want to want to get the IntelliSense completion stuff that she just showed, mm -hmm. all they have to do is go to aka.ms forward slash IntelliCode and they can download an extension that okay. will provide the IntelliSense completion experience that she just showed. Okay, and then it's appearing in a future Visual Studio. Yeah, so right now it's we an don't extension, know when. and then and then we will we will figure out how okay. in the future. Right. Uh, it, uh, this is the Visual Studio Futures talk, right? Yeah. Uh, we'll figure out how it how it makes it into mainline awesome. product. Cool. Yeah. Very yeah. very cool. Pretty cool. So that was an amazing amount of cool stuff coming in the product in the area of personal productivity. Can't wait to try all that stuff. What else we got? Well, cloud productivity. We have a lot of people migrating their apps to the cloud, mm -hmm. and there are some things that are a little bit different in the cloud. Number one. That's an understatement. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> we try to make it as, as symmetric as possible. Right. But, but one of the things that people get a little concerned about is thinking about security. Yes. If you want to take your source code and host it in the cloud and run it from the cloud, what do you have to think about with respect to security? So when you guys are, are thinking about this, are you thinking about features in Visual Studio to help that? Are you doing it in the whole realm of DevSecOps or both? We, we always approach all of our product development based on what are the pain points that our customers are experiencing okay. and how can we address those pain points. Mm -hmm. So it's never like a, hey, we have a really cool technology that, that we'd like to you know, bring to the world. It's always like, our customers are really having a hard time with something and how can we help them? Okay. And so we have some stuff around uh, security in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece that, that we've tried to look at is 
sometimes, as much as we try to make them as symmetric as possible, sometimes your on-premises app is different than what's running in the cloud. Sure. And so we've tried, we've had situations where people report that they have production issues that just won't repo, repro on their machine. Mm. And so how can they diagnose and address those issues? So that's that's the next demo that we want to okay, show you cool. is security and uh, and reproducing issues that happen in production. Excellent. Cool. So I've invited Anthony Cangelosi to come and show us what he's got. Thank hey, you, Anthony. Yeah. So Robert, you've probably heard this story before. Uh, Dev goes and wants to share some of the work that he's done out with the community. Puts it up on a public repository. Pick your favorite one. Remembers. Ah, Man, I just remembered I left the storage key for my cloud account uh, sitting inside of my source code when I published it. Man, oh, dummy me. I've okay. heard of that happening. You heard but that happening. It wasn't you, though, right? Like no, that. never you. So, well, anyway, some folks have made that mistake before. Mm -hmm. And uh, you go, you pull the repository down. You think you're fine. You wake up the next morning, you what think do you you're find? fine, but there's actually bots that crawl exactly. through GitHub looking for these things. Exactly. So it's you wake way up, you find thousands of dollars because those yes. bots find them like that. Yes. You don't have any time to get it down. And so really at the heart of this, you shouldn't have any secrets in your source code. But unfortunately, it gets really difficult, particularly if you're working in a team account mm -hmm. or with a bunch of other devs trying to manage secrets across your team. And so we've been working on some tools that will both help make it easier to find those secrets when they are in your source code, so you can catch them and get them out before they end up in a public repository, as well as to make it easy for you to pull them out of your source code and put them into something like Azure's Key Vault without actually adding any new source code into your app. So we can do this without changing any of your I code. think that's the key part there, because Visual Studio today will notice and give me squigglies in my config file that says, hey, dummy, you've got a password in here. It doesn't actually call me dummy, although it should. <laughs> <laughs> but now I think, oh, yeah, I should do something about that. But how do I do something about that? We'll make a Visual we'll Studio theme that has those kind <laughs> of like extra personal squiggles for right. you. So let me show you kind of in the context of, uh, of a sample app that we've been working on about kind of how this will work. So okay. um, I've got uh, the app here is the Smart Hotel 360 demo app that we've been using at Build and um, for some of our scenarios. It's a pretty full-fledged app we about did this. six episodes of this show on recently. Yeah. So you yep. know this app really yep. well. Well, so you should know that in, in this app here, um, when I go to book a reservation, uh, say I'm staying in Seattle, uh, for a couple of days, I can uh, set the dates I want, and then I can decide if I want to bring a pet with me. Mm -hmm. And when I decide whether I want to bring a pet, I can upload a photograph of my pet, make sure, one, it's a pet that meets the policies for the hotel. As long as it's a dog. Yeah. Exactly. The hotel is still cat unfriendly. No cats allowed. No, those guys will go and tear up the curtains, so we can't have that. Uh, but I guess. Some, well, anyway, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> uh, dogs are fine. Anyway, this will make sure it's a dog for us, but we'll also store that picture in a storage account so that we can personalize your experience later. A little personal picture mm -hmm. of the dog next to the pillow, et cetera, and we know who we're who the, who's visiting us. Great. So my dog is fine to visit. So let's. Uh, I've gone and uh, created a PR for this work, and I've uh, submitted into Team Services, and that's gone off and kicked off a build for me. So I should get some feedback soon telling me about whether or not that build has uh, passed or succeeded. And what we have now is we have been working on some integration to bring more of that information into the IDE. So you don't have to keep track of it and switch back and forth between Team Services and Visual Studio. We have a notification here telling me that actually the build that got kicked off from my PR has failed. Yeah. So now I can, can, I was working on some other work, I can pause what I'm doing and switch context and figure out what's going on there. So let's see what's going on. All right, so this is taking me now into the build that failed on Team Services. And yep, that last build that I kicked off, uh, or that was actually kicked off for me, failed. Let's see what task it landed on. So here we're getting as far as uh, this task uh, called CredScan, Analyze CredScan. Oh, have you heard of CredScan yes, before? It, yes, I have. You this have. is very cool. Isn't it really cool? Yep. So this is CredScan integrated as a build task into my build automation system. Here. Nice. And so for the other folks who don't know what CredScan is, CredScan is a utility that scans, you were actually talking about at the very beginning of the segment, mm -hmm. scans your source code for any kind of secrets, passwords, credentials. It'll find them and warn you about them before they end up a permanent party repository. So you can pull them out, roll them, change them, etc. So in fact, I do have a secret. I have a, the, the uh, cloud key for my storage account that I was using in mm -hmm. my source code. So let's figure out how I can actually take that out of the app and put it into an Azure Key Vault where it should be in the first place. So this is awesome. The build failed because you had that in there. So That's right. Now builds fail not because unit tests failed. Right. This brings a whole new uh, meaning to break the build. It's because you're 
publishing security. Yeah, we don't mess around with this. We don't, want, cool. we don't want this going through at all. So mm -hmm. we will stop the build right there. Now, we want to do even more to bring this even sooner, right? Like, we don't even want you to get to the point that you've submitted a PR. So we're looking at even further how we can bring this even closer to the dev experience. But right now, we've got a build task. Now, that build task is something that right now is in development. So mm -hmm. your viewers can expect to see this in the next few months or so as we start to make it available for customers to try it out. Okay. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that we want to bring to make sure that we're keeping our customer apps as secure as possible. But let me show you some things that are actually in uh, Visual Studio, what we call 15.7, or Visual Studio 2017's latest update. Yep. Um, we have some tools that make it possible for you to take that secret out and put it into a key vault without actually changing any of the source code. Okay. So let's see how that magic happens. All right, so I've got my app here. And uh, that secret that I was detecting is the storage key that you see here for my app. And uh, the storage key is getting read in, and this is what it's using for store storing in those, uh, those pictures. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over this node here, uh, Connected Services. And what Connected Services are is basically some tools inside of VS that make it easier to integrate Azure services. It's already got a bunch of the popular ones that you've probably been talking about on the show, things like Cognitive Services, old classics like Storage is available, mm -hmm. and we're adding more and more services into it. One of the ones we just added in was this uh, Secrets Key Vault or managing secrets <coughs> through Azure Key Vault. And what this is going to do is it's going to go and look up the subscriptions that I have under my identity. Let me switch over to my demo subscription that I'm using for this. And with that subscription now, it's going to go and see any key vaults that I might already have. Because I can take my secret and put it into, say, my team's key vault that they might mm -hmm. be sharing for all of their keys. Or as the uh, key vault team themselves would ascribe, they generally recommend one key vault per application. Okay. And so by default, when you click Add here, it's actually going to go and create a new key vault okay. for me on my subscription. I was just about to ask if you had to have a key vault or will it create a new one? You have to have one. So if you don't already have one, you have to create a new okay. one. But this will go and create one for you. So you don't have to worry about yeah. figuring out what all the right settings are on the portal. It'll pick okay. kind of the most popular, most common ones, mm -hmm. particularly for someone who's getting started. This is the right place to start. Cool. It'll go and create that key vault in my subscription for me. It'll also bring up this kind of tutorial that walks me through exactly how to go and use that key vault in my app. And this is in 15.7 now. Yeah, it's available today. Oh, go cool. download the okay. latest update. You'll get it. It's there. Um, yeah, so with that now, I've got a key vault set up in my app, and this is the one that is created. We're going to see it in a second. Now, I want to go and uh, grab that secret from my application. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it out of my application. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to run my application, what do you think would happen at this point? Uh, it probably failed because you don't have a storage key. There you go, right? So we've got to get that to work. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's go back into the connected service, and I want to manage the secrets in my key vault. So this is going to bring me now out into the portal. There's one thing I have to do here. So I have to take that and I have to put it into the vault. Right. Now, while that's coming up, if this was a real situation, we would have rolled that key. We would have changed the key, obviously, because at this point, it's already a permanent part of our, of our source code since it's been committed and in the PR. Right. This is demo stuff, so we're going to skip that step. Uh, but I've got now uh, generating a new key. Now, the important thing for me to remember here is I want to use the same name that I used for that configuration right. earlier. So I called that storage key over here. So I'm going to give it the same name, storage key. And then I'm going to paste that value okay. that I copied over, and I can click Create. All right. Now, in that key vault that was created for me, the one that VS created on the subscription, this is exactly that vault. It's got a key for me now. I can come back over to my application. Let me come back to where is the first place where I read that setting into, um, into a class. And I've got it here, the storage key. So I'm going to go ahead and F5 that application. And we'll see what we get back. So now, what Visual Studio is doing is it's obviously running my app locally in, in local IIS. Uh, but what it's also doing is now that I've got uh, Key Vault integrated with the app, it's downloaded the NuGet package, it's actually connecting to that Key Vault on my behalf. So the running app is actually connecting to that vault, but the way that it's doing is actually using my local identity. So I'm signing with Anthony at Microsoft.com, and it's using Anthony at Microsoft.com to go and pull the secret down from the vault and bring it into memory so it's available in memory the same way as any other configuration. So was you don't have to write the code to go out and read the Key Vault, it's all taken care of all taken automatically. The old, a NuGet package was added, and that's it, nice. and all that's available for me. <laughs> Super simple. And so now when I come over here and I hover over the data tip, you see that I'm still seeing that secret in memory. It's available, and it was pushed, mm -hmm. but now it's coming directly from the vault. Cool. Now, that works for me locally, but if I was working with like Amanda and a team of other devs working on this, well, I've just hosed them because now they don't have the secret to run it locally on their side. Right. So I can go back over to the key vault and, or into even the connected services. I could go straight to the vault, but I can give someone else access to this vault as well. And then from there, what I can do is I can give my dev team access and I can create a resource group from them. Mm -hmm. The other really cool thing I can do is I can add an app service and give an app service in Azure access to that vault. So now the next time we publish this, or more 
uh, accurately the next time our DevOps pipeline publishes into our dev environment, that app service already has permission to the vault. So it will continue to run even though the secret isn't available in configuration. And all of that works with uh, the free tier of app service. So mm -hmm. it used to be you had to get one of the higher end tiers where you needed to have certificates installed, which kind of up you into the service plans. This all works with the free tier. So devs can start playing around with it without having to worry about a whole lot of costs up front. And you can store anything in there. Uh, Passwords, these keys. Passwords, certificates, any kind of credentials can get stored inside Sweet. of there. Sweet. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that's that's kind of thing one. We talked about yep. the security challenges kind of moving to the cloud. Thing two is reproducing issues that you find when, when in production that right. don't reproduce locally on mm -hmm. your machine. So the next chapter of what we want to show you around cloud productivity is just around that problem, kind of reproducing issues that you found in production. Yeah. Cool. So, all right. So for this one now, uh, I've got a bug here that Kendra logged on me earlier, where she said, uh, "Customer who's trying out another feature we've been working on called Best Hotels, mm -hmm. where it's meant to try and find uh, some of the four and five star hotels." doesn't seem to be working for this customer. And when I look at this over here in my local environment, I'm actually seeing that the best hotels is actually bringing me some results back. So it's really, really bugging me. And I don't know about you, but probably the worst bugs to deal with are the ones where the customer can reproduce and you can't get it to reproduce right. locally. Drives me crazy. So what Kendra was able to do was... I usually just call that user error and move on. Yeah, move on. <laughs> just kind of, yeah, it's his fault. Well, when it's several of your customers or when your boss is calling you and Amanda is saying, deal with it, you, know, you kind of have to give it a little air time. So, what Kendra was able to do was she was actually able to take a trace at the time that the customer was reproducing the environment, mm -hmm. uh, reproducing the problem, and she was actually able to trace the exact customer experience in production. And she's shared that trace with me so that I can debug it locally. So let's see what the customer was seeing instead of what I'm seeing locally. Switch over to Visual Studio here. And um, now, this also, we're doing a lot of stuff that's yet to come, uh, but really exciting in development stuff. So, this is these traces that, that we're going to show you here are going to show some really cool experiences, uh, but they are on their way. Now, I'm going to start with uh, loading up the trace that Kendra sent me. So, I'm going to go over to debug a recorded process. This is a new command we're working on adding. And I'm going to pick out that trace that I had uh, run earlier. Here's some other traces I've read earlier. Actually, before I do that, I want to set a breakpoint just at the point where I kind of want to start stepping through the code where I think this is kind of the get method for mm -hmm. that page. And so I want to set that breakpoint ahead of time. Excuse me. And let's debug that recorded process. And then do what we do naturally. I'm going to start stepping through the code here and see what happens. All right, so we've landed on the get method. We've got, uh, we're loading, and so let me do a step over. I've got this method call here that calculates our best hotels. We, when we got all hotels, you see down here that there were three hotels that came back in our results. Mm -hmm. And if I step over again, best hotels, okay, that's interesting. I didn't get any hotels that matched the best hotels. All right, starting to get a little closer to my problem. Now, if, uh, if this was a real bug that, or that I was trying to reproduce locally, I might have to stop debugging to really get the environment and exactly, you know, to really dig into it without re you know, having any side effects to kind of setting, resetting my statement back. I'd have to stop debugging, kind of reset up the repro yep. again and come back to it. Instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to step back into. So I'm actually reversing, Ooh. yep, reversing <laughs> in the debugger in reverse because I've got a trace Which here. I kind of makes sense because that trace file is start to finish, so all of the steps are in there. But now we are giving you the ability to walk backwards through that, navigate them in either Very direction, nice. forwards or backwards, and so I can step back into. And so this method is already executed. So the next, so I'm going to keep stepping, and as I step. Where is it going to land me? It's actually going to land me at the end of the method since I'm stepping back in reverse time through mm -hmm. this method. Hard to follow, but kind of come with me here. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to step back into the method before that. Mm -hmm. And you see that, the up, that all of my locals and, and memory windows are all updating along the way. I'm going to step back into that method as well. And so here, now this is the method that actually does the calculation of the best hotel trying to find the ones that meet. Uh, and so, I've got this loop here. Now, I don't want to step through the three or four or so hotels that came back in the results. So when you, when you hit a loop and you want to cross it and you want to get to the other side of it, what do you do? Maybe set a breakpoint on the other end of it and then run to the breakpoint? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's do that. But let's do it in the other direction. So I'm going to set a breakpoint over here and I'm going to do something called reverse continue. <laughs> Does run to cursor work the same way? Run to cursor runs, works just the same way. Nice. And so now I've reversed all the way back past all of that loop. And now from here, I can start stepping forward again. And let me actually step through and see what's happening inside of this bug along the way and figure out exactly what's happening. This is cool. 
<laughs> very, very cool. Pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah, so I mean with this, you don't need to be worried about having your debug state kind of explore a different execution path than mm -hmm. what actually happened in production because right. you're actually only debugging the piece that actually happened in production. You also don't need to figure out what was all the environment conditions that could have caused the situation that happened in production because again, we're, this is the actual execution state that happened right. in production. So this is, this is a feature that we're working on. It's not something that you can download right now. Um, but so it's it's one of the things that I know we're talking about this in the context of cloud productivity, but this seems to be something I could use personally as well, right? I'm stepping through my code locally, and I I'm done with that loop, but I want to go back to the beginning of that loop. Yeah, can for I sure. use that right? Can well, I do that? So we have had kind of um, historical debugging yeah. that capability for a while. So mm -hmm. as long as you are. Um, as long as you are running locally and you've you've been part of that debug process, right. then then you can have that okay. capability. But what really is unique here is being able to capture a trace and then attach yes. a debug session yep. to that, and that's that's kind of a unique thing for what happens in production versus what happens right. locally. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Cool. Well, um, so I think with that we've gone through personal productivity yep. and then cloud productivity. And then the next chapter I want to show you next time is team productivity. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. So I hope you guys okay. have enjoyed this amazingly cool stuff. And we'll pick up again uh, in the future. See you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.